Hello there, welcome to another ARP2600 deep dive. And this is a pretty incredible preset. The sound isn't necessarily incredible, but the way it's constructed is there's some deep voodoo going on here. Let's listen to it. Sound of rain. Okay, let's try to figure out how that's built and make some pretty amazing discoveries about this tool as we go. First things first, um, something that I'm not particularly certain of, and I, I don't know why it's done, is an unusual connection out of the VCF. Normally the VCF uh, is pre-wired into this slot here, and it's, it's very often turned up, usually the case. In this situation, however, we're coming out of the VCF, into the processor, out of the processor, and into the socket that the VCF would have normally occupied anyway. I can't see a reason for that. This sound here, it's got a very long tail, sounds to my ears just the same as this. I don't think any significant change has been made to the signal path there. Normally I can see reasons why things would be connected and I can't there. So that's just one of those weird things. I, I'm, I, have, to, I have to admit, I don't, I don't get that. So let's, if we look at it from this perspective, it makes the thing a little bit cleaner. And we have a very straightforward setup, VCF feeding into the VCA. We've got uh, an envelope feeder being, sorry, an envelope uh, being generated by the AR uh, envelope down here. The ADSR is as normal, having no impact on the amplifier. The ADSR is typically used as a modulation effect elsewhere in the tool. So that's all very standard and, and we're comfortable with that. We've seen that many times. So let's try to figure out where the tone is coming from. And obviously we're looking at the VCF. We have all all five audio input sliders turned up, so this is going to take a bit of deconstructing. And the first thing I'm going to do is turn the ring mod off, because what the, the ring mod basically always adds a kind of metallic extra frequency oriented tone to your sound. So if we're looking at the graph, that's with everything on. If I turn the ring mod off, You just get an overall lessening across the entire frequency range. It's a little bit difficult to only hear the ring mod on its own for this sound because it sounds crazy. The reason it sounds crazy is because it's being fed by VCOs 1 and 2 and we're not going to understand how the ring mod is making its sound until we understand VCO 1 and 2. So just take it as red for now that the ring mod is adding extra frequency color to the entire spectrum by its multiplication of two oscillators. That's what ring mods do. But we have to put that aside just for the moment and, and try to work out what VCOs one and two are doing in their own right in order to, that's basically like a, an answer that's further down the line. So let's have a look at VCO one. Okay, more crazy frequency wide madness. So how are we generating that tone? I have to, everything in this preset is interconnected in a deeply incestuous way. So it's really difficult to actually pick out any individual oscillator and say, that's what that's doing. We just need to build a holistic view of it. So, First things first, we've got no keyboard control voltage input here. Doesn't matter what key I press on the keyboard, it's not tonally affecting VCO1 in its own right. We've got this connection here, which is overridden and it's coming from the modulation wheel. So the mod wheel is gonna have some impact on the sound. Here it's at its lowest. and it brightens the frequency when I turn it to the max. And then back down again, you can see those low frequencies coming in. 
Okay, we understand that. Let me turn that off so that we're not having that effect. Now then, this is a weird one. VCO2, the sine wave normal input into VCO1 is set very high. VCO2 in its own right is set pretty much as high as it can be. We've got a four foot wave here, which is your um, one octave above normal. And we're set plus 13 semitones higher than that. And so the sine wave that's coming out of this is oscillating really pretty quickly, like almost unnoticeably quickly. And it's having an FM effect on VCO1. And that is actually where your noise is coming from. Let's turn this down completely. That's what VCO1's actually doing. Let's ignore, ignore the ADSR for now. That's a, a red herring. But this is the tone that the VCO1 is actually generating, kind of natively, kind of. We've got all sorts of filter effects, so don't worry about that for now. But this tone there, you can see frequency spikes. You know, it is trying to generate tone. Ultimately, it's failing because what tone it is managing to, gener managing to generate is being completely obscured by the FM effect being introduced by VCO2 by this very, very quickly oscillating sine wave. As we bring this slider up, you see all those distinct frequencies disappear and it turns into noise. Let's turn VCO, VCO1 off and let's turn VCO2 on. Let's see what it's doing. A very, very similar thing. So let's have a look at VCO2. So similar to one, they're both set to four foot. Uh, we have different tunings, master tunings. That's at plus 24, that's at plus 13. We are hearing a different tone, but they're both almost toneless. Different color of noise, if you like. Now VCO2 is being modulated. <laughs> yeah, that's right, by VCO1. So we have the normal square wave input from VCO1, which is oscillating about as fast as it can. And it is having an FM effect on VCO2. If we turn this down, there's VCO2's natural tone. That's what it wants to make. It's horrible, absolutely horrible. Really, really high pitched. And when we use VCO1 as uh, an FM source, a frequency modulation source, we just wipe out all of those frequencies because they're, the pitch is being changed so much that there really isn't any pitch anymore. Everything just flattens out and we end up with white noise. And a, a very um, high frequency oriented white noise. When you generate white noise using two very fast oscillating um, oscillators like this, what you end up with is your noise concentrated in the upper frequency band. That's why we're getting that really crackly high sound. That effect is being further accentuated. I'm gonna turn them both on at the same time now. Okay, so now you can hear those two different colors of noise mixing with each other and you know accentuating that high frequency crackle stuff do this switch over here oscillator sync this is pretty esoteric stuff you get a little bit less crackle we've lost some of that definition back on you can hear it crackling what's going on here is that uh, oscillator two is um, restarting its period, basically re starting to redraw its wave every time oscillator one finishes. And what you end up with, I've got a picture of it somewhere. 
Where's my picture? Here. So we can see that oscillator 2 is synchronized here. It's drawing its wave. And when oscillator 1 gets to the end of its cycle, finishes drawing its wave, oscillator 2 starts drawing its wave again. And what you end up with is this little bit here doesn't occur in nature. We're not producing a natural tone anymore. Um, here we go. The resulting waveform is unique in that it can't be created by standard synthesis techniques such as layering or filtering. So synchronizing oscillators two together, uh, two oscillators together, gives you a, a way of drawing waveforms in a, in a unique way. No other process can do it. And what we end up with audibly, because we only care about what it sounds like. is a slight change to the colour of the tone in that it's producing those sharp, the, when the, the wave is restarting, we're just getting a slight sharpness to the noise. Really, really subtle stuff. The sound designers here have really excelled themselves. So let's throw the preset away and come back again. We, we just ignore this cable for now. We've, we've already dealt with it. So that's VCOs 1 and 2 operating in tandem. And between them, we get that. We've also seen the mod wheel having its impact on the tone. That's high, that's low. And you can see around 500, 700 hertz, those are extra frequencies coming in. And then when I turn the modulation wheel to the maximum, they're disappearing again. Once again, subtle effect, but you know, all of these things are adding to this sense of, you know, that, that nature, it's raining. When we finally, now that we understand how VCOs 1 and 2 are making their tone, if we bring the ring mod in, that is what happens when you multiply those two oscillators together to get your ring modulation effect. Bear in mind, all of this is being coloured by the tone, by the by the, uh, the the FM, the VCF controls down here. We're just having to deconstruct it bit by bit, and we can't hold it all in our heads at the same time. But I'm hoping that you can kind of build these building blocks one at a time. Okay, let's throw all that stuff away, and now let's have a listen to VCO three. What's going on here? Guess what? Yeah, more noise. So what have we got this time? Well, once again, we've got a very high pitch tone at plus 21 this time. Again, ever so slight differences of color in each of these pitches, each of these tones. We've got the sine wave FM effect coming from VCO2. If we take that away, we're gonna hear more of the natural nature of the VCO3 tone, which is EU. And then there's the, there's the noise coming in. And we wipe all those frequencies out and we're left with that. So in this case, we were left with a little bit of that tone. You know, it's been set such that it is still colored. That's VCO3. Now noise gen, I have spent some, try, some time trying to figure out what effect the noise gen is having on the sound. Naturally, it's actually not generating any tone at all. If you, there you go. If I bring the notch frequency right up, I get a really, really low rumble. And if I change from pink to white, I get a sound effect like that. So I think what this is for, bring this back down again is for you to add uh, your own modulation effect to your noise generator so that you can change the color of the noise dynamically. And you end up with that. I think that's what it's there for. Now, if we go back to the natural tone, the natural preset straight out of the box, you do get that effect in the background.
So yeah, it's obviously up to you completely how you choose to color that sound. We could, for instance, map it to a quick control. Um, uh, go into learn mode down here. There's our timbrel noise. And now, you know, we, we have we have that effect from our keyboard. It's beyond the scope of this particular deep dive to really start talking about theoretical possibilities, but that's the only thing that I can see that this noise generator is having. It doesn't have any audible effect on the tone whatsoever until you increase the whiteness of the noise. So that's, that's kind of cool. It's a little kind of Easter egg for you, I guess. Right, so we've generated, we've, we've dealt with our five audio inputs. Now let's have a look at the VCF controls. So here we've got a slider and don't read keyboard control voltage. I keep saying this over and over again. Don't fall into the mistake of thinking that's what this is doing. It isn't. There's a cable here. This cable is coming from the voltage processor. The voltage processor is being fed from two sources and they're being mixed together. So these two, these two sources here are linked. Number one is coming from the sample and hold out. So we've got noise coming out of the uh, sample and hold generator. And that's being mixed with the uh, sustain out from the AR envelope. So basically, whenever we have a key held down, this gate is open. This blue cable is sending in like a one. You know, the gate is open. That's being fed, that's being mixed with noise. And then those two sources together are being output to this VCF control here. So what's the effect of applying a noise filter when we have our key held down? Let's find out. can see it on SPAD. Now then as soon as I let go of the key, we start fading away to the tone that we would have had if that slider had been turned all of the way down. So that tonal effect is being applied while the key is held down. Once you let the key go, this gate shuts, or it begins to shut, it's got a release time, and then that noise tails away, okay? Very cool use of the release stage of the AR envelope. Not seen that before on a preset. Throw that away, get back to our normal setting. Okay. So we've basically kind of accidentally dealt with the voltage processor by looking at this slider here, because that's what these that's what these two connections are doing. Over here we've got an ADSR. Oh no, we haven't, sorry. Oh, made the same mistake myself. It's connected to the mod wheel. So we've got some kind of mod wheel impact, only fairly subtle on the VCF. That's mod wheels currently at max. Now it's at min. Now it's at max. So don't forget we're, de we're dealing with a notch frequency filter here. So as we're um, uh, applying control effects to this filter, we're changing the filter frequency of the notch control. So look at the notch, there it is. Let it settle down. So this is what all of these control effects are doing. They're changing that notch in the filter. And finally, we've got a tiny amount of effect coming from this 
and this requires us for the first time to deal with this monster. Get back to our basic preset sound. What the hell is going on over here? So first things first, we've got no inputs to the tracking generator. Okay, the tracking, tracking generator is generating its own waves and there are no external input sources to these modulation effects, but there are cables plugged into it. So what the hell am I talking about? Well, this cable here is coming from output B and this cable here is coming from output A. So even though there's no external modulation effect being applied to the tracking generator, there's an internal effect. It's actually modulating itself. Okay, I hope your brain hasn't exploded yet. Keep going, it's worth it. Let's have a look at the tracking generator. Here's wave one, here's wave two. They're almost opposite. When you look at the composite view on the graphs, you can see that when one is high, one is normally low. One of them is very noisy, one of them is a straight line curve, but they are kind of fighting each other. And these two modulation sources are being applied to the other wave. So we're getting really quite a crazy uh, mix of these two waves beyond my capacity to actually mentally process but you can hear the result of what's going on when this stuff gets output. So let's just concentrate on the theory for now and then we'll listen to it in a moment. So we've got these two waves modulating each other and that effect has even been accentuated because one of them is a positive modulation, one of them is negative. Then in addition to the outputs feeding internally into the generator itself, we're taking outputs elsewhere to the outside world. This green cable over here goes all the way into this socket here. And it's having a tiny effect on VCO2. It's an awful lot of work being put in for such a small effect. This cable over here uh, from this, uh, the top output is being fed into this VCF. And again, not much impact on the tone. So let's see what they would do if we cranked it up a bit. That's where your wind noise is coming from. <laughs> That's the frequency modulation on VCO2 being applied. So it's kind of insane how random that actually is but it's like spiked randomness as opposed to noise, which is just flat, you know, frequency filled noise. Now we've got spikes and, and crazy shapes being drawn by the tracking generator. One of them is being fed into the frequency control of VCO2, which as you saw is deeply incestuously related with other components and feeds into the VCO1 and, you know, creates mayhem over there. The other output is coming into the VCF and having a filter effect on the notch band that's being kind of, you know, thrown all over the place. Both of these waves are cycling very slowly. That's uh, 20 seconds to complete one cycle. That's about, what, six, just over six seconds for that one. So really, really slow evolving waves that are having all of these random modulation effects on the tone. Get back to our default sound again. And finally, I've saved the best for last. And this is just mind-blowingly good. See this light blue cable that we've ignored and I've kind of pointedly ignored every time there's been mention of ADSR. Lots of these things, there's an ADSR slider and there's one over here and there's one over here. And the, the keen-eyed amongst you might have noticed that I just kind of glossed over it and, and just not talked about it. This is what the ADSR is doing. <laughs> Isn't that just fantastic? I could do an entire tutorial episode 
on the effect that's being generated by this sequencer here. This is just truly magnificent. And it took me a while looking at this cable thinking, first of all, I was, I was messing with the ADSR sliders on these VCOs and going, I'm getting no effect from it. No matter where I put this slider, it, it's not having any change on the tone, what's going on. And then I realized, oh, the ADSR is taking an input. It's not being fed by the keyboard, which is its normal input. It's taking an input from an external source. Where is it coming from? Hang on a minute, the sequence is not running. What gives? Well, what happens if we turn the sequencer on? That's what happens. There's no indication in the preset that you're supposed to do that. There's no like in obvious or intrinsic means by which the sequencer gets enabled. You just have to learn the preset, look at the patch, figure out what all of these connections are doing and then come to the conclusion, hang on a minute, why is the clock out connected to something? What happens if we turn the sequencer on? So what is it doing? Well, lots and lots and lots of things. So we've got this 45 millisecond decay and then it's being sustained at maximum with a very, very slow release time. So even after the envelope has, uh, e after each one of these sequence of steps continue uh, as, 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 as fired, we've got this four second release time. So all of these things are kind of compounding on each other, which is why after we release the key, we're continuing to get all of those crazy sounds that if the sequence is not running, Okay, so now the sequencer has finished having its effect. If I hit another key, we won't hear those those really sharp frequency spikes. Now we're back to our dull, thudding grain tone. But all of that extra stuff, those frequency pops, are being introduced by the sequencer. Finally, we've got a colossal chunk of delay tagged onto the entire thing. So that's just helping to add to the general sense of mayhem and chaos. What a preset. One of those things that's really easy to jump over. You know, when you're looking for a synth tone or a cool arpeggio line, these are the these are the presets that you can just skip and miss. And yet if you deconstruct them and figure out what's actually going on under the hood, it's mind blowing. So once again, the ARP2600 has generated a sore throat and a need for a cup of tea. I'm going to go and have that now. Hope you enjoyed this episode and I'll see you for the next one. Thanks very much for watching.